All right, well today we continue on in a series uh, called Renewing Faith, and today we're going to talk about faith itself and what that looks like and how we think about faith. And my question for you, uh, we didn't have you do a question today, um, that's fine, uh, but it has to do with how are you living in faith? And the fact is, you are faithful people, even if you're agnostic or atheist. You are deeply faithful people. In fact, you may not have realized this, but you have exercised great faith already today. Did you know that? You really did. And actually, it has nothing to do with God, or maybe it has everything to do with God. I'm not sure, but sometime last night, before you went to bed, you checked your alarm, if you need an alarm, and you had faith that whatever wakes you up in the morning was going to wake you up in the morning. Now, maybe you're just one of those people that wakes up when the sun comes up. So you had faith as you went to bed last night that the sun would come up once again today. As you turned on the water valve, hopefully you bathed to some degree, at least brush your teeth, but who knows? You're wearing a mask. Nobody's going to know or care, perhaps. But you had faith that when you turned that on, that water was actually going to come out, which is confidence. It's faith that some engineer at some point in time who studied very deeply figured out, and a team of engineers and city planners and all that, had the wherewithal to figure out how all these things might work together that you might have water flowing out of your uh, faucet. It goes on and on and on. Uh, you chose to wear clothing today. Thank you, by the way. And I'm sure looking at me, you're equally grateful. <laughs> so I totally appreciate that. But that means that somewhere in you, you had a faith that the clothing that you are wearing is going to hold together, at least until you get home. Or you can fake it until you get home. Now, some of you have holes pre-fashioned into your clothing. Good for you. That's even faith that they're not going to rip any further while you're here today. Somebody sometime figured out how to put all these things together. Uh, scientific minds figured out how to mass produce this clothing that we have. You are people of faith. Most of you uh, took a car to get here today. A great act of faith. You turned on that car with great confidence that it was not going to explode. Do you realize you are driving a bomb, right? <laughs> I'll never forget my father uh, when I got, finally got my driver's license. I don't know why he said this to me, but he said, uh, Peter, you need to remember that this car can be very dangerous, it's basically a missile what, that you're driving every day. <laughs> it's like he thought I would drive too fast or recklessly or something. I don't know. But it, maybe because I do it on occasion. But anyway, you are driving a missile everywhere you go. You are trusting that science long before you figured out ways to put this piece of machinery together in a safe way. You are trusting the scientists who figured out how to make rubber tires that would grip the road and not give out right at the right moment, brake pads, the whole thing. You're out, you are deep people of faith, and you even believe in humanity as a whole, because as you're driving down the road, you are confident that most of the people that were also on the road did not desire to kill you <laughs> when you came uh, out into the open roads, right? They, they chose to pay attention themselves so that they would not direct their missile into your missile. You have faith all the times in all kinds of ways, from the food you eat to so many things. You have put your confidence in something that you have not really thought about, that you haven't had to think about, because it's just always been there. You are people of faith every day. I want to talk about a character today that I learned from our Black History Month presentation. The next screen. Uh, this is Garrett Morgan. Garrett Morgan comes from an interesting family background. He is, boy, he is mixed race. Uh, his father was a freed slave. His grandpa, so his father's father, was a decorated Confederate military leader. Sources are kind of divided on this. Wikipedia says he was a general in the Confederate Army. Another source said he was a colonel in the Confederate Army. Either way, he's up the food chain quite a while. And he fathered one of his slaves, a woman, obviously, and we got this man. Garrett Morgan eventually married his wife, who was the son or the daughter of a pastor, uh, and she herself uh, was mixed race as well. 
uh, from African descent and also indigenous peoples. So we have in Garrett Morgan, we have African, indigenous people, and some kind of European Caucasian. Uh, he's pretty famous. Uh, one of the things that he did for you uh, today, even though you may not have known to say his name out loud or to be grateful for him, uh, but he was uh, significant in helping the sewing machine industry move forward. He figured out ways to design sewing machines to last longer and to help them be more efficient. Actually, the way that he uh, earned his money, he ended up uh, living most of his life in Cleveland, and he did very, very well for himself. There was an issue with sewing, uh, where when they were uh, working with uh, woolen fabrics, uh, the needle would, because you're talking, you know, industry-level stuff, uh, the needle would heat up so much that it would cause so much friction in the wool that it would cause problems as they were working uh, with the texture itself. So he worked with uh, different kinds of products to put on the needle uh, so that that friction would be reduced and the problem would go away. And what he noticed was is that this particular product that he used in the sewing industry uh, seemed to deal, it softened uh, the wool fabric itself, the, the wool, whatever it is, and so that it wouldn't uh, curl up. And he had a revelation. This is how science works sometimes. You're trying to solve one problem, and you find out that you've also solved another problem. What he ended up developing was hair straightener so that people with really curly hair could have new options in terms of how they're going to style his hair. And that's how he made uh, a fortune. But it wasn't just limited to that. Uh, he also invented uh, the precursor to the modern day gas mask. He's the first guy, they call it a, a gas hood or a fire hood. And uh, actually, it's interesting. Um, he is... Um, quite famous for this in sort of a strange way. Uh, when he uh, first developed this thing, uh, his, his idea was uh, that firefighters uh, could put on this mask and go into burning buildings and rescue people uh, without uh, fearing smoke inhalation. There was a problem, though. Whenever he would go into the South and try to share his invention uh, with firefighters, they would take one look at him and say, we're not interested because he was black, to be expected. But that wasn't going to be the end of his story. He got creative. He hired a white guy, an actor, and he went on the road with this white guy who pretended to be or acted as if he was the inventor. Garrett Morgan himself then acted as the sidekick and completely played the part of the, the willing assistant to try on the gas mask and, and go into burning uh, facilities or go in the presence of smoke or whatever to see if this thing would work. So the audience now, who he's talking to, firefighters in the South primarily, now they're, they're trusting in this product because it's a white guy uh, who invented this, and this dumb black guy is dumb enough to believe in this stuff to go try it on and see what happens. That fit the paradigm and the narrative that they were very comfortable with, and he sold many, many gas masks that way. There came a day when that became very, very important in Cleveland. Uh, when I think about Cleveland, I think first about a, a city that my sister used to live in, and by the time I visited her, it's a really cool town. They had this area called the Flats uh, that they built up, really fun areas, cool eateries and things, fun stuff to do. Uh, but the Flats used to be an industrial wasteland. And if you... Uh, Watched Forrest Gump, you know, um, they'll depict people writing about environmental things and they're talking about uh, the water itself and the Cuyahoga River uh, burning. Uh, well, actually, that was a problem, not just in the 60s and 70s. It goes way back into the 1800s. Industrial waste was so bad that they needed to build a new tunnel four miles into Lake Erie <laughs> so that they could finally find fresh water to bring in for the city inhabitants to drink safely. The problem was, in 1914, uh, there were people um, a couple, three miles into that tunnel, and they hit a natural gas vein. And immediately it exploded, and immediately the tunnel uh, fell in, and many workers were dead. Uh, they sent in rescuers after them, but as soon as they got to that gassy area, they too, uh, many of them died. Uh, but Garrett uh, Morgan heard about this, and he and his brother put on his gas mask and personally went into the tunnel to rescue 
uh, the remaining survivors uh, who were there to be rescued and also pull some of the dead uh, out that they could be honored that way. Now, you can just imagine what happens in sales once this becomes a national story and they hear about how effective the gas mask was. You would naturally assume that this thing would take off in sales, right? Just the opposite. When people learned that the inventor of the gas mask, which they just saw, worked just fine, when they learned in 1914 that it was invented by a black man, sales actually plummeted. This tells a story about humanity and how we think, and how we value people, and how nonsensical things like this still have great power over us, so that if we believe in a particular narrative about a person who just saved lives before the country's eyes, somehow we can't trust it. This is part of the problem that we're still working with today. Things didn't end with the Emancipation Proclamation. There are other things at play and are still at play today. Well, one other thing that he invented, which actually you probably benefited from, many of you at least today, and that is that he's the guy that invented the warning stoplight. That yellow light that comes on, uh, that's a warning. Uh, that's a warning that the red light is about uh, to come on, meaning you'd better stop or you'd better gun it <laughs> to make sure you make the light. That's a whole different debate. We could divide our audience uh, on which way you view that yellow light. But he's the guy that's responsible for that. And why did he invent it? Because he recognized that there were people who, who were stopping too late and there were other people who were starting too soon into the intersection once they saw the green light. The yellow light helped everybody. Between these two things, and by the way, you think about dates and how important um, these two inventions were over time. Who knows how many lives have been saved just by that yellow light. And you think about trench warfare, which was a dominant uh, way to do war uh, in World War I. Uh, the way they would... Um, the way they would work in trench warfare is they would drop uh, gas uh, into the trenches that would stay in the trenches and not get out. So anybody that was in the trench would be immediately wiped out. Well, imagine how helpful a gas mask might be uh, for those soldiers. It's attributed to this guy, Garrett Morgan. He was resilient despite the racism that was rampant. He was successful, even though uh, there were so many things working against him. He just kept going and figuring out, how can I move forward? He also is credited with many other inventions. When I thought about different characters that I wanted to talk about uh, with you today, he came to mind because I thought, you know, faith is kind of like a couple of the inventions that he made. And what we've read in Psalms, and we're going to read again uh, from Jeremiah, and again, actually from Jesus as well, is that faith when done right, when you have healthy faith working for you, uh, it, it helps save you. It helps save you from things that might otherwise destroy you. In fact, that word save, it's kind of a loaded terms in, in Christianity because we generally think in terms of afterlife things. But really, it, that word save comes from uh, an original Greek word that means to heal or to make whole. And so faith is meant to help you heal and become more and more whole. That's what it does, like trees planted by the water bearing fruit in its season. You're going to get through. You're going to live. You're going to thrive. But without it, it's a lot riskier. Think about stoplights that way. Um, without that yellow light, you carry a lot more risk. When we have faith, we have a guide, we have a help that gets us along the way more safely. And I think about the gas mass, and I think, you know, faith is kind of like that. That when we, when we have faith and when it is a robust, strong faith, sometimes we enter into times where it's difficult to breathe. You know what I mean? And yet, because of our faith, we're allowed to breathe, and we know we're not just breathing air. We're breathing something more and deeper. It could be the very breath of God, and it gives us hope and strength to move forward. I know what you, you, you know what I'm talking about. There have been times in my life where the pain has been so great emotionally, I could barely catch my breath. But faith 
reminds us that we're not alone. And we're going to get through this, not alone, but by the strength of God. So I want you to keep that in mind uh, and be grateful for Garrett Morgan uh, for the rest of the day and the rest of your life. And here's this uh, guy who uh, most of the culture would write off, and yet he's been saving your life, even though you didn't know it. Let's jump into some text and see what we got here today. I'm just going to buzz saw through these just so you get the idea. This comes from Jeremiah, one of the great prophets of old, the weeping prophet. He says, this is what the Lord says. Now, remember, you're, you're not hearing a direct quote necessarily from uh, God's self, but you are hearing uh, what Jeremiah is sensing that God is wanting to say to his people. So everything that's coming through Jeremiah is coming through all the things that Jeremiah is. All the ways that Jeremiah sees the world and feels about the world is funneling through, picking up some of this as it goes through. Cursed are those who put their, are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. That should sound familiar, by the way, to the psalm. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? But I, the Lord, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Now, you need to understand that Jeremiah and his contemporaries at this time in Jewish history, they had no idea, no imagination for afterlife whatsoever. People didn't start thinking about afterlife until the the few hundred years before Jesus was born. They thought that when you died you died. And that was pretty much it. All of the things they talk about are that we all go to the place of the dead, which means that when we see uh, Jeremiah saying things like God rewards people for their life, well, that's just common sense. This fits some of the things that we talk about uh, with open and relational theology, right? There are consequences to our behavior, uh, and we should expect it to be that way. All right, let's fast forward to Jesus. Several hundred years, This is the beginning of his great sermon. Now, in Luke, he calls it the Sermon on the Plain. In Matthew, it's called the Sermon on the Mount. doesn't really make any difference. The sermons are slightly different, but they also share some things. In this particular uh, scene, it's called Sermon on the Plain uh, because it's a flatter area. And the way Jesus handles that massive crowd that's amassing to hear him teach is he takes one of the fishermen's boat, who now are his friends, and he puts out into the water just a little bit. So the shoreline is filled with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who now have become a part of a natural amphitheater to hear him speak. After Jesus did some healing of all kinds so that people are sort of um, given a proof stamp, you know, that God is with this guy. Jesus says this to the crowd. He starts his whole message this way. Jesus turned to his disciples and said, God blesses you who are poor, for the kingdom of God is yours. God blesses you who are hungry now, for you will be satisfied. God blesses you who weep now, for in due time, you will laugh. Goes on, says, what blessings await you when people hate you and exclude you and mock you and curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man? When that happens, be happy. Yes, leap for joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, their ancestors treated the ancient prophets that same way. And he goes on to say, words of doom which sound just like the psalm and Jeremiah. But what sorrow awaits you who are rich? For you have your only happiness now. What sorrow awaits you who are fat and prosperous now? For a time of awful hunger awaits you. What sorrow awaits you who laugh now? For laughing will turn to mourning and sorrow. What sorrow awaits you who are praised by the crowds? For their ancestors also praised false prophets. Jeremiah and Jesus are contrasting life lived by the way of faith versus the way of the world. So I'm going to ask the question today, what does it mean to be a person of faith? Before I do, when I, get, when I talk about these things, these blessings and woes, Matthew doesn't do it the same. Matthew 
uh, just talks about blessed are you who are poor, blessed are you who are meek, blessed are you who are hungry. Uh, something's really important for us to, to understand. So when Jesus was speaking to that crowd, he was talking to a crowd of very, very, very poor people. Like 99.9% of, of the people were very poor. They were under Roman oppression. They didn't have many rights. They were happy to eat every day. Whenever you would see people of wealth who are what the words when he talks about fat and prosperous, he's being quite literal. He's saying, if you have enough money in the bank that you can afford uh, to eat that much, it clearly states that you're eating at the expense of who knows how many people around you. So he's drawing a contrast that everybody else in that original audience is going to recognize. So we need to remember that. And one of the things that I want to say about that, about why this makes sense, I, I heard a friend recently shared just a very short clip from a well-known uh, conservative uh, podcaster, and he sometimes talks about scripture, and he was really troubled uh, by this meek will inherit the earth thing. Because in his sensibility, in his worldview, that doesn't make any sense at all. The meek, you know, the meek and lowly, they inherit the earth? Show me. You know, that's kind of what he was getting at. He could not make sense. How could Jesus be saying this? Because it doesn't make sense. So he did a bunch of research. I don't know exactly how he researched this or, or where he got his information from. He may, in fact, be exactly right in what he said. But he said that one of the pictures of meekness that he found was a person who has a sword but keeps it in its scabbard, keeps it stowed instead of pulling it out. As if to say that the meek that Jesus is referring to is a person who exercises great control, that they could kill some people, but they're choosing not to. And as I thought about that, recognizing Jesus' audience, it was definitely common for people to carry around a knife or a sword perhaps. But don't look at that as a clerk position of power, not when the Roman government is around. Think if you had the U.S. military might inhabiting your home. <laughs> they are decked out with the highest tech, most funded military machine that the world has ever seen. We have over one million uh, military personnel with the highest tech equipment that money can buy. Now imagine you've got a group of, of U.S. military in your village. Now you keep a 22 for, your, for hunting rabbits maybe or to scare off animals. But let me ask you, if you're in that village and your village is essentially occupied by U.S. military. How, how courageous would it be for you to raise that 22 caliber rifle, which means the bullet's about this big, how courageous would you really be to fire that at any U.S. military personnel? You'd be a fool. This is not a person who's keeping their sword in their scabbard because they're so strong and tough. <laughs> The picture that we have here from Jesus is, again, somebody who has nothing, who has no rights. And it says, if Jesus is saying, the mystery here, the key to this mystery is Jesus is saying, you who've got nothing, you probably have a better shot of tapping into what really is real than those who have everything in this life. Those who have everything are very likely distracted by all the stuff that they've accumulated and acquired, all the busyness that that has created in their schedules. But you, you who are so poor, you're not even sure you're going to eat. When you eat that, that spoonful of beans, you thank God. Whereas while they're drinking their $200 bottle of wine and their $200 an ounce caviar, do they give a rip? You who are dirt poor and can't afford mansions, let alone even a foundation for a home. You who are so in touch with the earth where the earth is the only thing you've got. There's a better chance you will see just how much you have because of your poverty. I've witnessed this, by the way. Witnessed this in the slums of Haruma, right outside Nairobi, Kenya. And a handful of you have been there to witness it too where you see people who are 
expressing a depth of joy when they should not because of their living conditions. It is, I think, one of the most confounding things that people experience when they go over there. How can you be filled with joy when this is the state of your life? They're living proof of what Jesus is saying. You and I who live in relative luxury, we need to think about this. That maybe the way we're thinking about what success and what being tied into what really, really matters, maybe we're off. And that brings faith itself into question. So I'm just going to briefly go through. And uh, in our book that we're going through with Marcus Board, uh, he gives us four different ways of thinking about faith. And the first one on the first screen that we're going to look at is faith as a census. A census, this Greek word, uh, refers to our intellectual assents or affirmations. The belief became uh, about believing a, a notion contrary to evidence and common sense. So there was an actual time in history when this happened, uh, when belief shifted uh, towards something else. And one of the ways that it shifted had to do with science itself. Religion and science were best friends for so long until the scientific method and the scientists who used that method decided to apply the scientific method on the Bible. And when they started to find examples of things in the Bible that did not make scientific sense, they called the authority of the Bible into question. And now the religious leaders had to make a decision. How do we understand this? How do we deal with this when we've been telling people this is basically what God has said? And instead of choosing to go into a, what is now a more very current way of thinking about how we interpret text, which is appreciate context, understand influences it around, understand genre, understand what led to the development of this text and why people would look at it that way. Instead of doing that, which would have been so helpful if they would, they doubled down on, nope, the Bible is the word of God, period. Whatever is in it is absolutely accurate and true. So they decided at that moment to allow a chasm uh, to be constructed between religion and faith. And faith from that point, especially in the Western world, came, became more about what do we believe to be true? What is the dogma or the doctrine that we say we must believe this? And once I believe this and sign off on it, I now have faith. So I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only son, uh, covered. I believe in the Bible. I believe in an afterlife, dot, 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 bullet point, bullet point, bullet point. And in our Western world, that's really what faith is, even if it doesn't make sense with science. So belief alone, uh, however, has little transformative power. Uh, have you ever known a Christian who's been walking around uh, proclaiming their belief, meaning a census, as a person of faith, who's a complete jerk? Has anybody ever experienced such a thing? <laughs> right. Believing a faith statement does not necessarily change anything about your life. All it does is make you feel good about what you believe with your brain. So there must be another way to think about faith, which Borg gets into. So on the next slide, he talks about this other word, which is also used to talk about faith, and that's fiducia. Uh, you might hear uh, this used in um, business circles, your fiduciary responsibility. And this has to do with radical trust, radical trust in God. Soren Kierkegaard uh, referred to this as like floating in the ocean, that you, you trust your own buoyancy, uh, trusting the buoyancy of God. And if you've ever taught a kid to swim or if you remember learning to swim, the dumbest thing you can do when you're trying to float in the water is to flail around like this because you'll sink like a rock. But if you relax, if you lay on your back and just breathe, or tread in ways that keep you afloat, you're going to be all right. There's a buoyancy that's there. It's trusting in that. Jesus spoke about this reality of faith. He said, don't worry about, don't worry about the, your life and the troubles that you have. Don't worry about tomorrow. Consider the birds of the air. They don't worry about tomorrow. Uh, they, there's enough for them today. And you who are worried about your clothing and all that, don't worry about that stuff. Look at the flowers in the field, he says. They're clothed, clothed better than Solomon in all his glory. And so Jesus understands that this is a radical trust uh, in God. 
that can give us great peace and alleviate a lot of anxiety. Now, Borg goes a little too far uh, in his book, and this was pointed out to me a couple years ago teaching the course, where he essentially says, if you're a person of faith, you won't worry. If you're a person of faith, you won't have anxiety. And just, I just want to say really clearly that anxiety is a clinical condition that is very different uh, than just your common everyday worrying about stuff. And so don't equate those two things. Some of us beat ourselves up if we struggle with anxiety or depression or other mental health uh, issues. Uh, we beat ourselves up thinking, well, if I only had more faith. You're talking about two different things. Um, we also believe um, that in some circumstances and ways that we don't fully understand all that's going on behind the scenes, uh, that healing happens uh, for people. Well, if you break your finger or break your leg, you don't sit there with a broken leg thinking, if I only had more faith, right? No, you get your leg treated. So how do we understand this trust and where are the dynamics? You know, if you go to a personal trainer or physical therapy for whatever it is that you're needing help with, if you just want to grow in your physical fitness or whatever, that personal trainer is going to be your best friend and your most hated enemy, right? Because what they're going to do is they're going to want your best and they're going to suggest all kinds of exercises and things you're going to do and you're going to hate it especially the day after you do them, <laughs> right? You're, you're, he's off the Christmas card list, right? How dare you make me do those exercises? I'm in utter pain. I'm in agony. You're trying to kill me. I know it, right? That's what we do. The same thing happens with counselors. When we go to counseling, it can be incredibly, it can be an incredibly vulnerable thing because if we're not trying to game the counseling and we're not trying to just say what we want the counselor to hear about us, to believe whatever narrative we've told about ourselves, but if we actually open ourselves up and are completely transparent with the counselor, it's an incredibly vulnerable experience, speaking from experience. And sometimes we don't like what the counselor says. Yeah, I had trouble um, back in May. I had to take, use up all my vacation in May because of some wrong ways of thinking in my head that a counselor helped me figure out. I did not like hearing what the counselor was mirroring back to me because it was something I didn't, I wanted to correct in myself. Well, counseling does that. We trust in the counselor to speak truth in us, to be on our side because they want us to be well, to get over our stuff. This is fiduciary faith. Uh, for your finances, how many of you, let's just be honest, how many of you have your entire life savings stepped into a mattress today? Just raise your hand. Right, can we get your address before you leave today? <laughs> right? I would guess that none of you would be willing to raise your hand for security reasons, but I would guess that maybe none of you keep your entire life savings buried in your mattress anymore because you know it's a really bad idea for lots and lots of reasons. It's not safe against thieves. It's not safe necessarily against fire. And you know it's a dumb investment. It's going to sit there and not do anything for you for as long as it sits there. In fact, it is going to decrease in its value while it sits as a trophy in your fire safe right? So we know not to do that. A financial advisor comes to us and we trust their best. We trust their skill set. We trust their minds. We have fiduciary faith in a financial planner who says, okay, for the first 30 days, we want you to track every dime you spend. Now, the first week, you're excited about this, but then you come back after a month and you realize just how much money you spent at Starbucks or whatever. And the Financial planner says, well, you made it, you survived a month, but if you really want to get to where you're going, you're going to have to think about these things, about where you're spending your money and how much you're saving if you really want to achieve your goals. At that point, just like the personal trainer, the person becomes our enemy, right? Because we don't want to hear that kind of news. We have a fiduciary faith in a financial planner, a life coach, same, I think you get the drift. And so when we think about the character and nature of God and what it means to have faith in God, it means that we trust in the goodness and the character of God in our lives. We just trust that it's there. The next type of faith has to do with fidelitas. This has to do with faithfulness to God. This is a radical centering on God, uh, a, a loyalty to God. 
Now, the opposite we might think is infidelity, which it kind of is, but infidelity in and of itself doesn't really help us understand this. Infidelity, by the way, is a massive biblical image uh, that the prophets use in terms of faith. They called the entire, the prophets called the entire people of Israel, uh, 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 what am I trying to say, uh, that, they were, that they had committed adultery against God, the entire people of Israel. So we're clearly not just talking about sex here. We're talking about something else. And I like this word idolatry because in a sense, that really is a better way to think. Uh, that in our idolatry, we are putting something ahead of the other. Generally, in marriage relationships where this is an issue or other kinds of relationships too, I suppose, it means that we put our own selfish desires before the other. So we don't necessarily even consider the desires of the other we're thinking primarily about what we want to do uh, as, a, as an individual, not what would benefit the relationship itself. The same is true for God. What does it mean for us to be in faithful relationship with God? Uh, how, are we, how are we attentive to God, or are we just about ourselves? I think about this in my own life, in my own marriage, actually. So, Lynn and I, uh, we're kind of cultural caricatures in reverse. Uh, so I grew up uh, the youngest of two older sisters. Uh, my sisters are nine and 11 years older than me. And as I was a kid, when Saturday afternoon would roll around, uh, I had zero, con- I never had control of the remote control, if I'm being honest. Uh, and my sisters always had control on Sunday afternoons, what we were going to watch on TV if we were watching TV. They never, ever watched sports. You know what my sisters were interested in? Musical theater. So I saw more Doris Day than any four or five-year-old boy ever should, (laughs) right? I knew these stories. I knew these. I could sing the songs. But what happened with that is I grew up just thinking, oh, these are lovely stories. These are lovely songs. And I, because I lived in a musical family as well, I became a fan of musical theater and was in musical theater, you know, as a high school student and college uh, student and even as an adult. Uh, And it's fun and I love it. And I love going to, to see musicals and all that. It's still a huge thing that I like. Now we watch some sports. That's sort of the more of the characteristic thing that might, or caricaturization of boys. Boys like sports. Uh, girls like theater. Uh, what, whatever. Um, we'd watch it occasionally, but but not so much. Uh, Sunday afternoons, my dad would watch football. He he was a pastor, uh, and usually what happens for pastors is they hit about two o'clock and they're out cold <laughs> from Sunday morning. And such was the case with my dad. My dad would have a newspaper like this. He'd watch uh, the football game, whatever was on, and by about uh, six minutes into the second quarter, he's like this. And so it was not this highlight of the day. Now, my wife, on the other hand, uh, she herself was a jock, uh, played sports throughout high school and on through college. Uh, And her dad, uh, every Sunday afternoon, and probably Saturdays as well, one of her favorite memories is the two of them sitting on the couch watching the Kansas City Royals lose to whoever they were playing (laughs) most of the time. Now, there was an era there where they did pretty good. I know she's laughing at me right now. Uh, So she grew up in this house where watching sports was the thing. And my wife, she's a sports fan. Um, I was having a conversation with Bob before our Wednesday group talking about that. You know, my, my wife, when she can't sleep at night, whereas I might sing a song in my head, she's literally starting on the East Coast and going through the starting pitching lineups of all the major league teams <laughs> to help her work through. That's what I'm talking about. She says, I'm not a sports fan. Yeah, I am a sports fan. I watch lots of sports. She's a sports nut. She's a true fanatic, right? So what happened when you brought us two together? Well, on our first several dates, we didn't really talk about this dynamic. Then all of a sudden we're married and time goes and all of a sudden these differences kind of emerge. Well, an interesting thing happened. We both wanted this relationship to work and we both loved each other. And you know what happened very naturally? It wasn't even a planned thing. We began to love what the other person loved. And the way that expressed itself, it just evolved very naturally as I became more interested in sports. So I can, I can sit there with her, and I want to sit there and watch the Warriors and the Giants and the Niners, not the Bengals, not the Rams, come on, <laughs> but definitely good teams. And we can sit there and enjoy it together. Am I at the level of fandom that she is? No, never will be. That's all right. 
And the same thing happened on the other side. She began to gravitate toward music as well and appreciate that so that now she is also a fan of musical theater and occasionally watching uh, a musical (laughs) on TV, although they don't show up quite as often. I think this is a good uh, way to think about fidelitas, that it's not just about some, you know, horrible act, you know, which is so obvious to see, but the real positive side of it is how can we be faithful in our relationship? And the real question is how do we learn to love what God loves? Do you even know what God loves? Because when we start to love what God loves, we find ourselves more and more in love with God, and we experience more of the love of God in our life. The final way of thinking about uh, faith, and then we're about wrapped, is faith as visio. And you might guess that this has to do with sharing the same vision of God. Uh, How do we see the whole, uh, the world, uh, the reality of everything? Do we see it as hostile or threatening or indifferent? Or do we see it as life-giving and nourishing? Well, one of those three things, threatening, indifferent, or sustaining and nurturing, One of those three things is how God sees the world, and the other two are not. So we have an operating system at play here. Uh, if If we feel constantly like the world is out to get us and we're under constant threat, I think Jesus would say back to us, and so would the Hall of Fame of Faith people, they would say, well, wait a minute, God created this world to be good. You're alive after all. Uh, your, Your body's working. And this earth produces food that's keeping you alive, and there's air to breathe, and there's water to drink. This place is made for us to live. So look and see what life is right in front of you. And sometimes we feel like it's indifferent, but but that's also not true of how God sees the world, because God does not have an indifferent view toward us. How would things change if we began to focus on seeing the world as God sees it? I don't know if you've recognized this, but... Um, you know, that way of seeing the world, uh, Garrett Morgan, that inventor that we talked about earlier. Uh, here's a guy that, that began to see the world differently. He had, man, he had every right to feel put out and victimized. His own grandpa uh, was a victim of rape uh, from a Confederate soldier, from a Confederate leader. Uh, his own skin color would prevent him Uh, according to how the world would see it, as ever succeeding. And yet, instead of looking at it as a threatening world, and instead of seeing it as even an indifferent world, that there was really no hope and the world wouldn't care, he actually decided to see it through a different lens, one where there's possibility, because he had a bigger vision of the world than the darkest portions and the shadowiest part of our personalities. One other thing you might recognize is you know, this way of thinking about faith, especially these last three words, are different than that first way of a census. It doesn't mean that how we put together our faith and our own personal theology it doesn't mean that that doesn't matter, because it does. There are reasons to go back and examine what you believe and why you believe it, and does anything need to change? That's really healthy. That's why I took you through open and relational theology, to help you see where the foundation needs to be tuck pointed and changed. Because if we have a good uh, theology that makes sense in the world, it just, especially in the Western world, it it just gives us that much more foundation. But the grand total of faith has to do with our relationship with God. Do we trust that God is really with us, giving us buoyancy as in an ocean? Do Do we want to be faithful toward God and loving the things that God loves? Do we want to see the world in the way that God sees? This is faith. How are you doing in your faith? And what aspects that have you seen today that you hadn't really thought about faith being like that before? And are there any things, any aspects of this faith, which is defined by multiple words, not just one, multiple paradigms, not just one. Are there any of those paradigms that you're sensing maybe today? I need to do some thinking about that. There's hope for me here because I thought faith was just about believing the right dogma, but it turns out it's really a relationship, one that can be grown, one that can help you through, uh, saving you from many ills and supporting you as a gas mask when it's tough to breathe.
The invitation of God is always here for us, always here to move forward toward our best. You know, sometimes like that personal trainer, we don't, we don't sometimes like God. But when we really trust God, we realize that even some of the things that we might not want to hear God saying to us are actually very good. The invitation of God is for you today. How will you say yes to that invitation to move forward with God? Even if it pinches a little, trust God is good. Let's pray together. Then we're going to end with the prayer of Jesus by Jim Cotter, which I said we would. But before we get to that, let me just lead you in a meditation. So God, as we are still before you, help us hear your still small voice. What's our takeaway today, God? Help us, help us identify it. I'm asking you, Spirit of God, the light of the world, to help us identify what one or two things are we really hearing today? And God, I'm asking that your Spirit continue to work in us nudge us, illumine things for us. Because I'm guessing that there are related behaviors to that take-home uh, point. There are invitations. This is not just some lump dogma thing that we have a light bulb moment on, but that light bulb moment requires action. And so God, can your spirit help us see what action are you calling toward today? What do you want us to do? with what we've heard. Holy Spirit, can you help us recognize our fears for why we haven't done it already? Maybe it was ignorance. Maybe we truly didn't know, but my guess is that on a lot of the things that we talk about and think about, this invitation has been there a while. God, help us know what's kept us. What's kept us from saying yes? God, can you help remind us that you're a God worth believing in? As we understand you more, there is a way of believing that makes sense intellectually. There is a way of believing that allows us to trust you as a personal trainer, as a life counselor, as a financial planner. There is a way of believing uh, that helps us fall in love with you more as we find ourselves loving the things that you love and experiencing your love in return. And there is a way of faith that gives us a much bigger, broader, more beautiful vision of the world. And you're inviting us into that in a deeper way today. May we have minds open, hearts soft, and hands and feet willing to go where you call. God, we choose to end our prayer today by reciting the prayer of Jesus. Crosswalk, say it out loud with me. Eternal spirit, earth maker, pain bearer, life giver, source of all this is and that shall be, father and mother of us all, loving God in whom is heaven. The hallowing of your name echo through the universe. The way of your justice be followed by peoples of the world. Your heavenly will be done by all created beings. Your commonwealth of peace and freedom sustain our hope and come on earth. With the bread we need for today, feed us. In the hurts we absorb from one another, forgive us. In times of temptation and test, strengthen us. From trials too great to endure, spare us. From the grip of all that is evil, free us. For you reign in the glory of the power that is love now and forever. Amen.
Thank you for coming today. I hope you had a good experience. Hope you have a beautiful, wonderful day, and we'll see you next week. Take care. Thank you.